The Bible tells us that God's perfect love casts out fear. And so we wonder why do churches turn around and implant fear? Polygamy, What Love Is This? is next. She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free. But I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me, and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, Polygamy? What love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And I am your host, Doris Hansen, and we're glad that you've decided to share some of your evening with us. We're here on Thursday nights, and we talk about polygamy and a lot of the teachings around this culture that began with Joseph Smith in the early Mormon church and has trickled down into our culture today that talks about and teaches uh, that polygamy is something that God requires when indeed he does not. And with the polygamy doctrine also is a lot of peripheral doctrine that goes with being born and raised in this culture and especially in a polygamy group. Before we get started, we do have a couple of announcements uh, that I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, just a note for our viewers who may not realize it, but we do have this show uh, is being broadcast on Sunday evenings or Sunday afternoons on KCLP channel 18 in the Boise, Nampa, Idaho area. So if you know anyone up in that area who might be interested in our topic, you might want to tell them. I'm not exactly sure what time on Sunday afternoon it starts, but I do know because I get calls from people up there that it is being shown every Sunday afternoon, so you might want to tell them. Also, uh, we have an announcement to make uh, about a stage production that is being t uh, taking place in Calvary Chapel uh, the next couple of weeks. It's a stage production of Look for the Morning Star, and it's coming uh, to Calvary Chapel in Salt Lake beginning May 30th, of course, that's next week. Uh, this production is set in the 1960s during the Vietnam War era, and it's, the story follows a young man's battle for his faith when he returns from the horrors of the Vietnam War, and it shows uh, authentic video footage and pictures and letters that were written home by a young Marine. There will be eight performances beginning Thursday night, May 30th, and it will run for the next two weekends, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights for two weekends beginning at 7 p.m. Now that's at Calvary Chapel, and, and that's located at 460 West Century Drive, which is just off I-15 and the 4500 South freeway. So if you're interested in that production, it's a very good one, I understand. Uh, you might want to check it out. You could probably go to their website as well, Calvary Chapel website, and get the information. So give it a try. I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. Last week, we received a comment, um, which happens every once in a while, <laughs> accusing me and the show of being evil. But I would like to ask the question, what is considered being evil. We back up what we say, <clears throat> everything we say with scripture from the Bible or with historical quotes of early Mormonism. So I can only ask the question, are those evil? 
are, are those two things evil because that's what we say um, at, at, without apology we do rely upon the Bible for our comments for our doctrine and for behavior that we talk about so is that evil honestly we would like to know we would like to know what we have done and said that is incorrect based on historical quotes and references that we've made can you please give us specific errors that we've made that you have personally checked out for yourself based on the references and quotes that we've used. And again, we have to say, if you haven't done your own uh, homework and checked this out for yourself, then really you shouldn't be making judgments on things uh, that you are uneducated about. And the past couple of weeks, we've been discussing with Earl Erskine, who is our co-host. Uh, thanks for coming. And My pleasure. Being it's here it's been share. fun. <laughs> This Some interesting stuff. It's been a very interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, we've been discussing the characteristics of counterfeit religions that claim that they follow God, and yet when all is said and done, they are so far away from the biblical teachings of God and of Jesus Christ. Uh, so if you ever wonder if your religious organization is truly from God, you may want to ask yourself some very pertinent questions about your group and answer them honestly, of course. And that's what this series about is about, some red flags that are might be waved when you look at certain doctrines and practices of your religion and of your leadership. Where did your doctrines come from? Do they match up with biblical teachings? Is everything that's done in your religion or in your, or in your group, is it done in God's love? Are, are they focused on Jesus Christ or is their main focus on the group itself or on your works or on your obedience to the group? Do they teach eternal life is a gift of grace um, through Jesus Christ or is Jesus just a part of your process to get to a, a heaven? Most members of Mormon polygamy groups have been born and raised in the group from birth. And they are raised to believe false doctrine about polygamy as first introduced by Joseph Smith. This series is for those who have never taken the opportunity to check out what they believe and why they believe it. It may be true that your parents, maybe even your grandparents, taught you that this was the only way to God. But it's also true that they could have been wrong. So check it out. It's your eternity, not theirs. And eternity never ends, and you're responsible to choose where you go. And please understand that when we use the word Mormonism on our show, we are including all of the Mormon factions, including the Mormon fundamentalists, as well as all the others who follow the teachings of Joseph Smith. Many people are still unaware that Mormon polygamists are followers of Joseph Smith. He's the author of the Mormon religion, so Mormon polygamists are actually the enduring to the end true Mormons. <laughs> On the last two shows, we discussed six characteristics to recognize a counterfeit religious organization. And so we'll quickly review those six, and then we'll start with number seven. So the yeah, six those, we've already discussed. Those first six we've discussed. First is an exalted, imperialistic type of a leader or prophet. Bible plus new revelations, new and changing doctrines. Mind control, time control in varying degrees. Works, work salvation mentality, grace is marginalized or completely discarded, groups exclusivity, they alone are God's chosen, and lastly, different Jesus, different God, and a different gospel. Okay, and those are all things that we need to look out for and watch out for when we are being told certain aspects of certain, uh, especially these private religious groups who claim that they are the only way to heaven. So number seven, we'll start with the series tonight. And the, the characteristic to watch out for is the counterfeit religions use Bible verses out of context. They'll twist Bible passages and they'll change terminology definitions. That's something I did not know they did until <laughs> after I started doing it. I had no idea they changed what certain words what, actually meant. And what they, and how they actually are used in the Bible, uh -huh. and, yet, and yet you heard them differently. Very yeah. different, and applied differently. Counterfeit religious groups always manipulate the Bible passages to make it mean something it doesn't mean, and that always happens. The Bible's twisted to fit the group's own private interpretations, making the Bible conform to their own unique religion 
religious system. They often claim that true just, uh, Christianity disappeared from the planet or that it went into apostasy, that Christian churches all teach empty religion. And then they'll turn around and they'll distort true biblical Christianity and then claim that they are the true Christians. But we have a quote here uh, that we want to share with you uh, yeah. from Hiram M. Hiram, Smith. Hiram M. Smith, a conference report back in 1916. It says, Christianity has failed in establishing those principles which Christ taught among the children of men. A false doctrine is a corrupt doctrine. A false religion is a corrupt religion. A false teacher is a corrupt teacher. Any man who teaches a false doctrine, who believes and practices and teaches a false religion, is a corrupt professor, because he teaches that which is impure and not true. That is the trouble with Christianity today. It is not true. That which is known as Christianity is the falsest of all religions in the world. Now that's a very interesting quote coming yeah. from uh, from this man because Christianity and Joseph Smith said the same thing all the religions of the world were that's corrupt right. and all this he, stuff. He but that. you know what Christianity hasn't changed since that day. No. The Bible remains the same, Christian doctrine remains the same, Christian practice remains the same. Nothing has changed in Christianity, but now they want to be Christians. Yeah, it's been their doctrine and their books that have changed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, four thousand over four thousand changes in the Book of Mormon, yeah. and and but Christianity hasn't changed. So what, something has changed here that he would charge Christianity for being all of these false professors and false doctrine when actually it is them. It, it, it is them who's made the changes, and then they want to be called Christians. It, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, that. that was one of the things I noticed too coming out was the scriptures that I used to use as a Latter-day Saint and as a missionary even, how out of context they were taken. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Absolutely. Just, you, know, they, they, you ought to read Isaiah 2.2 2 and then read Isaiah 2.1 sometime <laughs> and just see what those two verses say yeah, just that's, that's, for interest's sake. Yeah, and you know, counterfeit groups will mix truth with error. They use Christian vocabulary so that the person who is not familiar with sound biblical doctrine will be completely unable to discern those distortions. Scripture is taken out of context, like we were just saying, and changed to fit their own beliefs. But Scripture must always be taken and read in context, meaning that the entire passage must be considered to determine the proper application and interpretation. It's incomparable to somebody walking into a room where uh, there's a, been a conversation going on between some people for a very long time and the person who walks in the room just gets this little tiny portion well, of the conversation. Yeah. How can he interpret what the entire conversation was about? And if here's just this little bit. And that's exactly what people are doing when they lift a verse out of biblical context and they just plant it into a totally different conversation. It just plain doesn't fit. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the conversation in that chapter is resurrection. It isn't heaven. Mormonism has taken certain words out of chapter 15 and they've lifted them out of the conversation and then they've brought them over here and put them into a different, completely different conversation, added a couple of words of their own and got three degrees of glory out of it. Yet the conversation in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is not the Mormon concept of heaven at all. That kind of testimony would never be accepted in a court of law, mm -hmm. and it certainly won't be accepted in the courts of heaven. Yeah, it talks about celestial being heavenly bodies and uh, terrestrial being earthly bodies. Right. It has nothing to do with uh, degrees of glory. In it's heaven, just heaven yeah. and earth. And the word celestial is not even there. And celestial is not it's even not there. not even there. They just take it and they twist it around, pull it out of conversation, put it somewhere else and have a whole new doctrine made out of it and then get mad at us when we say yeah. it isn't there. Every counterfeit religious group redefines biblical terminology, especially the meanings like salvation and heaven and hell and the gospel. And one biblical um, term that's always reduced into insignificance, we talked a little bit last week and has been grossly redefined, is the doctrine of grace. Yeah. Yet eternal life itself is 100% contingent on grace. It's important to know what grace really is. Grace is what God gives us as His gift to us everything that we need to have eternal life 
everything that we need is God's grace and He gives it to us. He gives us forgiveness. He washes our sins away forever in, in true godly repentance. He gives us the perfection. He gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ free, free. We do nothing to earn it. The only part we play is just to trust Him alone, which will create a response from us of repentance in, and, and, and God does the rest. Repentance and we love God and, and our response, of course, will be the works that the Mormons and the polygamists are trying to do to get to heaven, yeah. which doesn't get us anywhere. Grace is never, we do our part and God will do the rest. That is not grace at all. That's a perversion of God's definition of grace. Grace is free, 100% free. And if you add any part of it to it, any of your works to it, you're going to miss grace. And then it becomes works which will cause your failure rather than your victory. Grace is tossing out everything and everyone else and taking Jesus at his word which is, of course, you would mean you'd have to toss Joseph Smith. Yeah, I, I just enjoy so much reading Hebrews now where it talks about the law has no, the shedding of blood, uh, blood of bulls and goats yeah. and, and living the law cannot save, uh, doesn't yeah. do anything for sin Nothing. and not understanding that. And I didn't know that even coming out of the church. That wasn't one of the things that ever really struck me until mm -hmm. we became... Christian and realized that this free gift of Christ is you just can't have grace and works mm -mm. It's either one or the other one either or the grace other. or law Right and um, and law will condemn you because nobody can keep the law perfectly exactly. So they need, We're they, all sinners they need and, that grace so badly and it's not a free gift I mean, it's it is a free gift, but it's not it's not free license to no. do what you want right you you uh, you don't work for your salvation you are given the salvation and then you work because you love. Mm -hmm. And the different, the thing is, that in order to have grace, you've got to throw off everything else. Yeah. Jesus said, if you need to forsake all and pick up your cross and come and follow me. So forsaking everything means you've got to let go of it all. Everything, uh, just clean slate, take Jesus at his word and follow him. And that's what, that's what it is. And the one thing that struck me, and I know this is kind of simplistic, but this sounds so godlike. I mean, it, you wouldn't think that God would be so complicated and convoluted. Right. He's asked, he said, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Uh -huh. Trust in his gift and, and right. it just seems God-like to and, me now and, that and I it, never understood it before. It is, he's made it so simple, nobody will ever have an excuse for not taking it because yeah. he's made it so simple. And then the, uh, what really bugs me is things like polygamy where it comes along and say, oh, you've got to live polygamy. Oh, That's yeah. not God-like at all. No. Uh, it, it's not simple, it's so complicated and painful and God is good and he doesn't require yeah, that kind of require thing. It. When we determine to read the Bible, we really must also use a recognized uh, scholarly Bible translation that was taken from the original language manuscripts. For instance, the, the, the New World so-called translation and the Joseph Smith so-called inspired version of the Bible are really not translations at all. Neither one has any manuscript evidence. Neither one was actually translated from existing and trustworthy Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. So they must be treated as being contrived because they are contrived. They cannot be tested by existing manuscript or, uh, at all. Um, uh, so And uh, they, they cannot be tested as being true by any existing manuscripts. Any so-called translation without manuscript evidence to prove their veracity should be rejected. And you'll be led astray if you don't follow the, the good guidelines. Of course, that's the devil's plan. Yeah. But God told us in 1 Thessalonians, he yeah, gave us instruction. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 it says, test everything, hold on to the good. So test everything, he said. And now he certainly didn't, didn't, when he said this, he certainly didn't have in mind that there would be no way to test everything. There, he has a way for us to test it. God has preserved every single word that he communicated to us in the Bible. And he has preserved also an historical trail to follow so that we can test it. And so that we can know that his word has been perfect transmitted down through the ages. There's some gorgeous verses in Psalm yeah. 119 we wanted to share. Yeah, there's three of them here in Psalms 119. Your laws endure to this day. 
Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Sounds like a long time. Yes, it does. And all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. So we have here his own testimony, God's yeah. testimony, that his word would endure, that they are true, that they are eternal, that they'll last forever. And these verses were written over 3,000 years ago, long before the Book of Mormon ever came into being. So it's not referring to the Book of Mormon. It's referring to the biblical text, to God's Bible. We were taught when I was growing up, and I continue to hear people say they were taught this, I don't know if you were or not, that the Catholics came along in the, the, in the Dark Ages and took all the Bible manuscripts and, and destroyed them, got rid of them, or, or corrupted them by taking out the good, plain and precious things and putting in their own doctrines and exchanging them then uh, the good manuscripts with the tampered manuscripts with the Catholic dogma in it. But that can't be true if you think about that even for a couple of moments. That can't possibly be true. Mainly because today's Bibles don't have any of the teachings in it that's unique to, to the Catholic religion. It's such a good point you make. Uh, <laughs> the Book of Mormon itself is the one that talks about the great and abominable church taking out the plain and precious things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where that, uh, gen where the genesis from. of that yeah. But it's interesting that, as you were talking about earlier, no manuscript support for those changes in the Bible. Right. There's no manuscript support for the Book of Mormon, of At course, all, either. for the whole At book. All. None and of no it. archaeology or anything else Nothing to go with it. So. Yeah. so they'll condemn the one, the Bible, yeah. that has all of the evidence to prove it's true, yeah. and they'll accept the other who has, that has absolutely no evidence And when for you talk about whatsoever. the Catholic Church, you think if they were making changes that they would have included all of their doctrine, of their doctrine. in the, somehow mm -hmm. in the, the book, into the Bible yeah. in order to deceive us. The other interesting thing about that, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls comes along mm -hmm. and uh, discounts all of Joseph Smith's changes to the Old Testament and right. proves to us that, that the great and abominable church didn't touch the, at least the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are a lot of New Testament manuscripts that support Right. Our current and and there's a, a lot of people who have tried to corrupt the Bible. They've tried sure. to, but the manuscript evidence for the uncorrupted, unchanged biblical text exists in thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscript copies. copies. Yeah. So we don't even have to worry about that. We can trust that God said that He would and He did preserve His word. Number eight in the counterfeit religious uh, characteristics to watch out for is financial uh, subjugation. Now, the counterfeit religious groups, especially the polygamy groups, I'm telling you, they're, they're really something when it comes to this. They require their members to forsake all material prosperity, and they turn all to their group, all their personal property and their money. And this, of course, is called the United Order, which is another false doctrine dreamed up by Joseph Smith. Now, they don't just demand 10%, but in some groups, all of their money and property must be turned over to the group's management. Management, and of course, they are then free to use their members' money for any purposes that they choose and without any accountability. And then they are counseled not to question the way it's used. And the guilt that they heap upon members who try to use their own money for their own personal needs is horrendous. That guilt, I'm telling you, is awful. Some polygamy groups own and operate some very lucrative businesses and they require their members to work for them at low, low wages. And they then, they won't pay them with a paycheck, they will pay them with a statement. And that statement explains how much money they made um, on their which would have been a paycheck, and all of that money is turned into the group. Again, with no detailed accountability, it's never available and it's never offered. The members often live in absolute poverty because the leadership has it all. And some religions actually require members to minister at certain callings in their group and a called member cannot say no without fear of backlash. They must respond to what is labeled God's calling and then they brag because they have unpaid ministry. Yet God says that if your time is spent ministering the gospel, then your living should be paid for by the gospel. In other words, the worker is worth his wages and they should be paid for their work. Now this isn't saying that volunteer work isn't acceptable, but that unpaid ministry is not mandatory. It is saying that when long, hard, mandatory hours and labor are given for their religion, 
paying wages to them is an obligation. And we have a scripture to back it up. Yeah, two of them here. First Timothy 5.18 says, For the scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. And when you think about an ox walking around, it, he's entitled to eat some of the grain. Mm -hmm. So if you muzzle him, he doesn't yeah. get to eat the he, grain. He's making the grain and yeah. he gets to he gets eat some the, of that grain. The wor worker is, uh, de deserves his wages. And mm -hmm. in 1 Corinthians, it says, in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now that's clear. <laughs> that seems clear. That's very clear. So I, I think the uh, higher ups in the, at least the mainstream LDS church have taken that to heart. I think oh, they, they get paid, I yeah. Think they are and the same with the polygamy groups, the higher ups do get paid. But yeah, wasn't it Warren Jeffs that had a 29,000 square foot house? I think we covered that a few mm -hmm. weeks ago or something. Yeah, it was and Willie, unbelievable. Willie and Jessup's got it by default, by I think. <laughs> yeah. So they're <laughs> certainly taken care of there. Well, yeah. They do. They take care of the higher ups, the hierarchy, but the the wow. um, the members, the the regular members in the groups usually live in pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, you should see the poverty I was raised in. You wouldn't believe it. You'd think I was telling a lie if I told you some of the 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 things that we had to mm. put up with growing up. Many groups will use money as their tool to to draw or to hold members. Some polygamy groups even charge an entry fee for people who want to come and join their group. They will charge them thousands of dollars just to become a member and it's not refundable it becomes part of the group itself and if any religious group claims that they need your money to survive or charges people to join your religion that's a huge red flag god tells us that the earth is the lord's and everything in it he doesn't need our money Tithing or turning your money into the group is not necessary for eternal life. Tithing is not fire insurance. Tithing is not even a New Testament commandment. Now, you might be shocked at that, but that's true. I was shocked Fal at that. <laughs> yeah. False religions will always demand their full tithe and sometimes much more. Many of them teach that giving them their money helps buy eternal life or even the eternal life of others. But Jesus saves, not tithing. And eternal life is a free gift of God's grace. Tithing does not help pay for it. Romans 6.23. Yeah. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin is death, but God's gift is, is eternal, eternal life. life. You don't pay for it. Tithing does not secure eternal life at all. How can it be a gift if it was? Tithing never adds to anyone's chances of eternal life. It's a private matter between God and the giver. Tithing does not wipe away sins, and that's what's required to get into heaven. And how can we serve in the how we serve in the, uh, the church that we attend is something that God personally calls us to do. He uses no mediator to tell us what to do. No one has the authority between you and God to tell you what God is calling you to do or how much God is telling you to tithe. God works from His heart to our heart. He is a personal God. He's not a group God and not through any mediator except Jesus Christ who is God. We have some scriptures that teach us that our gifts to the ministry should not be considered mandatory, but by cheerful willingness, according to what we have, we don't give if we don't have it to give. Yeah, think about this when you're thinking about the widow's might too, because that was a scripture we always used about to justify the tithing, I guess, that we were paying. And, oh. But she gave 100%. Yeah. So that's yeah. a little different. That, there's a guilt trip for you. Yeah. Second Corinthians, two of them, it says, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. And 9-7 uh, says, So let us each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So he's not saying having title sell, tithe settlement no. at and all. If you can afford 20%, 50%, then that's, and God puts that on your heart, that's, that's what you should give. Again, you're not buying your salvation. Right, right. <laughs> absolutely yeah. right. And, and, and we bring this up because some religious groups, I know, I know for a fact, these next two examples I'm giving you are, have happened. Um, in some religious groups. Some w have suggested that they, the, the tither doesn't have the money to pay tithe, so they've said, go take out a loan, and if you do that to pay your tithe, God will bless you so that you can pay back the loan. Mm. That is 
not biblical. One polygamy group especially uh, required a certain member to give his credit card to be turned over to the leadership who then turned around and charged thousands and thousands of dollars to that credit card and required the member to pay it back. Told him not to fret too much about it because it was the Lord's work, he claimed. But we know one thing for sure, that isn't the Lord's work. I want to give credit to, I don't remember the gentleman's name that gave this to me, but it, it was just so funny because it, it kind of struck along with this discussion. It says, or he asked the question, if, if a, a member of the church gives his donation or his tithing to someone else, uh, to another church or to an organization and doesn't give it to the main stream LDS church, would he, could he consider that tithing? And I know from the LDS church's perspective that is That's not true. No, yeah. Because when you send out a missionary that what now is about $400 a month, you're required to pay that and you're required and to pay your, your tithing. Tithe, huh? Tithing is totally separate. And you could never take that tithing and give it to huh. another organization oh. or you have to pay it to the, mm. to the church. I, that's bad. That's, that's significant, bad news. Really. Yeah, really, yeah, it, it really is. is um, because God doesn't do His accounting system that way no. at all. Not at all. Uh, love's a cheerful giver. That's true. That's right. <laughs> and we give out of what we have, not out of what we don't have. And we are to take care of our family. We're to take care of obligations, and we are to give as well. We can all work it in our budget, but there's not a required amount, and there is never tithing settlement ever. You'll never find that in the Bible. Number nine. <laughs> Paranoia. Counterfeit religious groups will produce paranoia and or a persecution complex. They always view outsiders with suspicion and hostility. If members have doubts or questions about doctrine or authority, they can be severely disciplined. Yeah. They could be disfellowshipped. They could be kicked out or excommunicated, removed from the membership, and then forced to endure a long and unbiblical process to prove themselves worthy to be accepted back into their church. They teach that Satan is the source of all doubt or questions, and so those who leave are followers of Satan in their eyes. Asking too many questions could result in a severe warning and threats to shut your mouth. But what did Jesus say about that? In John 6, it says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You know, I can't uh, tell you how that warmed my heart the first time I ever read that really? scripture. Yes. It took because that guilt away. It, and... Yeah, because when Jesus accepts somebody, it's permanent. He doesn't kick you out. He says he will in no wise cast you out if you truly come to Jesus. Now, notice he says we come to Jesus. We don't come to a church. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who you are. Jesus will accept you if you come to him like a child. And you know what? Children are full of questions, uh, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're very inquisitive. <laughs> they want to know. And Jesus won't throw you out for asking questions. And he'll not excommunicate you or threaten you if you don't keep your mouth shut. So ask your questions. The disciples asked Jesus questions all the time, and he answered even the tough questions. Jesus encouraged individuals to investigate and to judge things for themselves. And in Luke 12, it says, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? That means that we are supposed to make judgments, yeah. doesn't it? Be discerning. Uh-huh, be yeah. discerning, check yeah. things out, judge, make judgments for ourselves what is right. This means that we can and should make judgments based on facts, not because someone else told us what to believe and 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 the way to find facts is to ask questions and to study them out and if that means that you study yourself right out of your church great the truth is worth everything now god tells us what he considers to be a noble trait in human beings in Acts 17, it says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So they tested what Paul yeah. said. Is, is he lying or telling the truth? Is he teaching false doctrine? Was he a false teacher? And they found out he was telling the truth, and so they placed their faith 
in Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is and what freedom there is in knowing the truth. The word of God is replete with warnings that false prophets, false apostles, false religions can do works of false miracles. Just because a miracle was seemingly been done never ever proves that it was done by God. First John 4. 4 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I think one of the significant things about this too is he's talking about this, the Bible that we have in hand. So mm -hmm. anything else that comes along would be the false. You should match whatever comes along with what we have as our anchor, the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible came first. Yeah. It set the standard. It's yeah. the measure. So it, that should be what we measure and, and, everything against. And anything that comes after that is the one that's supposed to be suspect, not that's the right. Bible, not that's the right. original thing. Yeah. Spiritual experiences need to be tested. Spiritual experiences in and of themselves do not measure or prove truth or reality. This verse tells us, commands us to test those spiritual experiences because not all of them are from God. We have another one in Revelation. 2.2, two, two, it says, I know that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Oh my goodness. Mm. Do, do, you, do we dare test to see if our apostles and our leaders are true or false? There are guidelines in the Bible about apostles and about teachers and about our church leadership. Jesus gave particular recognition to this church and a particular commendation to them because they tested those who claimed to be apostles, but they were not. And we've, over the years, you and, and now I've uh, read a number of apostles, apostles in these latter days that have said things that are just totally crazy mm -hmm. and don't they're not biblical mm -hmm. and they've turned out to be false and mm -hmm. these men claim to be apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ that's so, right you know. that's so true yeah. and it's easy to test it's easy to test God gave us the measurement and he expects us to use that measurement for our tests. Well, we're not as far along as we'd like to be on our list of, of uh, <laughs> A couple more characteristics, left, huh? but uh, it is time to take our break and open up the telephone lines. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820, 973-TV20. We'd love to hear from you. Um, yes, we do like to hear from people uh, who disagree with us. We just expect a two-way conversation, an opportunity to explain whatever it is that you are trying to tell us so that we can have that two-way conversation. And so give us a call if you'd like to enter the conversation, if you have questions or comments. Um, and right now we're going to share our message with you. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we have made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real-life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. 
simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Welcome back to our show tonight. Of course, this is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And Earl Erskine and I, uh, our co-host Earl Erskine, and uh, I'm the host, Doris Hansen. We're talking about uh, characteristics of counterfeit religious groups, some of the many different characteristics to look out for if you are thinking of joining a group or if you're in a group and you question uh, maybe something that they're not doing or teaching can be quite right. Our telephone lines are open if you'd like to call in and enter the conversation or ask questions or make comments. We'd love to hear from you. And I also would like to mention right here that uh, next week we're going to take a break in our um, series here. We still have more to do in following weeks on this series, but next week we're going to take a break and our guest is going to be Rob Bowman. He is from the Institute of Religious Research. You can go to irr.org and, and to find out some good information from that website, but he's going to be our guest and we're going to be talking about what does the Bible have to say about eternal marriage? And he's a very uh, soft-spoken man. He talks with, with uh, a very much love and kindness, but he's also scholarly in everything that he says that the Bible says about eternal marriage. It's a very, very interesting conversation, so tune in next week. Okay, we do have uh, more to cover tonight if our phone calls don't come in, but right now we do have, uh, the lines are full, but we have one call ready. She is Rose from West Valley City. Hello, Rose. Hi. Hello, Rose, you're on the air. Hi, I'm, you, when you first made that, that, um, that quote from, uh, about Christianity not being, um, being the most corrupt. Yes. It, I, when I joined the church, I was 16, I'm 55, and I remember in no way were we considered or told to call ourselves Christian. That's right. And I was wondering if you knew approximately how many years it's been since, because you talk to young uh, Mormons now, and it's like, oh, yes, we're Christians. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you knew when it started that they started deciding to call themselves Christians. Do you remember when that metamorphosis took place? My recollection is pretty recent. Uh, I don't, I've never had respect Ten for- years, isn't it? It's only I, been a few years in my mind, uh, at least. I, I read don't. an article a um, few years ago that the, the National Council of Churches would refuse to let the Mormon church join because they weren't Christian. At that time, Gordon Hinckley was not president. He was, you know, where he was in line, but he wasn't the president of the church. And he was in charge of, uh, or took charge somehow uh, behind the scenes to do everything he could PR-wise to make Mormonism appear Christian so that they could join the National Council of Churches. And that's oh. when it began. Okay. And what, that's when it began. Has it been in the 90s or 80s? It's early 90s. Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe it started in the late 80s or sometime in the 80s, but the article I read I, was in the early 90s. So, Rose, you're absolutely... I also had a question about um, tithing. Uh-huh. Um, I've always felt um, that the 10% was a have to thing. Um, where or how can you tell me to... Um, because I have friends that say, well, they take, pay tithing if they can afford it. And I felt you pay tithing and the Lord will help you with other things. Well, again, it's like, it's like we said, the New Testament, there's no command for tithe. The Old Testament Israelites, there was, and the word tithe is the word for 10%. That's what the word tithe means, is 10%. But that's an Old Testament to the Israelites um, uh, commandment. But when you get into the New Testament, we read that we give what we have, we give what we can, we give because God has told us what to give. Some people can only give 1%, some can give 90%. We give out of what we have, not out of what we don't have, and because we want to, not because we have to. For God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. He, and cheerful givers are those who give from their heart, not because they're told they have to do it. 
God doesn't force anything. God will never force anyone to go to heaven. He'll never force anyone to pay tithe. If you're in a religion that forces you or guilt trips you to do something, you need to get out because that's not the way God works. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling. I appreciate your show. Thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Okay. We have on line two, Anonymous from Salt Lake City. Hello, Anonymous. Yes. You're on the air. What's your question? Okay. Okay, my question is, you mentioned that about the tithing, that uh, the church should not ask how much you should pay, how you should pay. But if you look in the New Testament, uh, Peter, he was collecting the tithing. And this couple came to pay the tithing, but they were holding back some. And Peter knew that they were not being honest. And the, and the lady, the wife, she brought that. Yes. Look at, if you look in the notes, I, I know that story very well, but that's not tithing, ma'am. No, no. That has nothing to do with tithing. Okay. Another thing that I would like to mention is, like, about the polygamy, you know. Um, um, we don't know, Heavenly Father, he, he works in a mysterious ways, and sometimes we don't know, you know. But at that time that uh, the Lord came and said that... Uh, no, pol no polygamy, it is wrong, you know. I know that it was very difficult for those families to be separate, you know. Where does but it say no polygamy is wrong? People, if those people had to choose to follow the prophet, but they didn't, they, they made the wrong decision to go by themselves in groups and leave the polygamy, they didn't follow. The prophet. We're not supposed to follow any prophet. We're supposed to follow Jesus, period. And they, no prophet. And the scripture says, too, if there is a false, there's a false prophet. Yes. If there is a false prophet. prophet uh -huh. And a false prophet will teach prophet. you to live polygamy, which is what Joseph Smith did. And another did. thing, too, the church of Jesus Christ, they help tons of people. You don't need it to be LDS to get food, to have clothes, you know. And I know for fact, maybe no LDS goes to the bishop and they get uh, uh, Okay, are, are you trying to make a point? Would you, would you make, what is your point that you're trying to make with your conversation here? My point is that Doris and her companion there they are complete, completely different. They don't know the scriptures. They are, you know, in the, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon is a second testimony of Jesus Christ. And then we Mormons, we teach about Christ. We okay, uh, ma'am, this is where this this is where our conversation hear. ends Christ because we've covered hear. that many times on the show in the past. The Book of Mormon is not from God. The Bible is. We do know the Bible scriptures. We've quoted them. That's all we ever do on the show is quote the Bible scriptures, and we have not taken them out of context or anything. We're sorry, ma'am, but the Book of Mormon. You show me proof of it. Just bring me some proof some solid archaeological proof, and we'll talk about uh, whether or not it can be uh, valid or not. But the way it stands right now, it's not valid. No, and you have to determine which Book of Mormon you're going to look at, the 1830 or the current one. Good point. So it's changed. Good point, because the 1830 yeah. Book of Mormon is totally different. Well, not totally, totally, but a lot different than the one today yeah. is. Okay, we have on line three, Sharon calling from Midvale. Hello, Sharon. Yes. You're on the air. Okay. What's your question? Um, uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, yes, you're on the air. What's your question? Um, it, um, what about when Jesus said, 
faith without works is dead. Jesus did not say that. It was in, it's in James, and he's not talking about going to heaven and how to get to heaven. He's not talking, that's not the context. Now, we talked about how to use scripture in context tonight, and James is talking about people who claim that they are saved. Let's, how do you prove that you're saved? He's not talking about how to get saved. And somebody came to Jesus, and we talked this verse last week, John, yeah. Jesus, in John 6, 29. What do we do to, to do the works of God? And this is when Jesus said, believe on him whom he has sent. So to believe is how you become a Christian, how you get your eternal life, and then faith without works is dead proves that you have actually done this. And it's faith first. Faith without faith works first. is dead, but it's faith first. Faith first. Then the works will come because right. of love. Okay. Um, and also, when Jesus was here, he said, join my church. He didn't say, have a relationship with me. He, he said, join my church. He didn't say, join my church. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. He, he, says, I, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not right. prevail against it. Church. But he did not say, join my church. The Catholic church wrote the Bible. The Catholic Church didn't even exist when the Bible was written. Yeah, the, the, the Catholic, Church Sharon, Bible. the Catholic Church did not even exist when the Bible was written. The Bible was already written and canonized before the Catholic Church ever be, became in existence. You better check your history. Well. Yeah, check it out. That's what we want you to do. Well, check it well, out. Um, I think um, they was the fa early fathers were the first Catholic. No, they weren't, ma'am. You need to check out your history because that is not true. Yes, it is. Check it's your history out. Before now. you say it, you better check it out or you're going to make yourself into a fool. Check it out, ma'am. Well, maybe she didn't want to do that. Okay, we have an off-the-air question. Uh, it says, we were taught that Joseph Smith, not Jesus, would judge all LDS. Uh, well, yeah, they were taught a lot of things. Yeah, th that Joseph Smith would be one of those that would judge us as we go into heaven. We'd have to pass by him and, and I suppose Jesus as well, but, but Joseph Smith would be there and he would, he's actually the prophet of this dispensation and he would be the one to, mm -hmm. to judge the, this dispensation. And, and, and Brigham Young and a few others taught that he would be at the judgment bar yeah. and nobody would be able to enter heaven without, without Joseph, Joseph Smith. Smith. But the Bible is clear. And you can read this in many places, but Acts chapter 17 is one that he has, God has placed a time, a day, an appointed day when judgment will come by Jesus Christ. He's the judge and no one else is the judge. Well, we have some other things to cover, but I don't think we're going to have time to do it. So let's go uh, to one of those letters that we wanted to oh, read. Okay. Um, we have a letter that we received, an email actually, that we received um, about our show on May 8th. Okay. So let's read that letter. I'll read that. I just watched your May 8th show, and it seemed that the LDS Church sure fits the mold of a false religious group. Well, at least they caught the idea there, huh? Yeah. It is so definitely a mind-controlled church. As you mentioned, people who are controlled by a cult have no idea that they are programmed and controlled. Fast and testimony meeting is very definitely a mind control method. Little children are encouraged to march up to the front and say, I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet and that the church is true. They repeat it and repeat it, and before they know what they're saying, they are completely under the influence. On my mission, we were often told to repeat and repeat the same things we wanted people to believe, and we were given the instructions that repetition brings conviction. Little did I realize that I was under the control programming also. Wow. I've also, I've discussed religion with my friend in the past, and if she feels cornered, she'll always say, well, I know that Joseph Smith was a true prophet. If I ask her how she knows, she just says, I just know it, and that's all I need to know. We were always told to bear our testimony if we were given a question we couldn't answer. Joseph Smith did a terrible thing when he introduced polygamy. He brought so much misery into the world and who knows how much longer it will go on. Not only are those who are living in polygamy suffering, but many LDS women still suffer because the church believes it will continue in heaven. What is really terrible is that Joseph Smith blamed it all on God. He was surely being led by the devil. I love you, love and admire you, Doris, and want you to know that there are many of us praying for you. God bless M. We really enjoy and admire Earl, too. 
Okay. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you for those Emma. compliments. But I think found it interesting um, where she talks about how repetition brings conviction. I mean, you yeah. go over, or you kind of get under your own mesmerization or something, wouldn't you, when you, that yeah. goes on and on and, and on. I think it's an anticipation, emotional. It's very much of the heart, very much emotion. And whether it's going into the temple or whether you're watching a movie or some other thing, if you anticipate. I mean, I remember watching a movie and I want to share it with my wife or something, so I'll watch it again and I know what's coming up and I get almost emotionally involved and I just know that, uh, you know, that's an emotion that you just feel and I think the church uh, uses that a lot. And if you repeat it as a child mm -hmm. so often, and they hear it from the adults and, yeah. and other children are doing it. So yeah. it, it is just something that, and yet from and a child. you don't realize it when you're doing it. How can the child check it out? God says test everything. How can a yeah. child test out that they've got, you know? And you know what? A testimony is not a, mesmer, or a memorized saying. A yeah. testimony is a personal experience with Jesus Christ. That lady said the Bible didn't say that we are supposed to have a personal experience with Jesus. Yes, it does. All through the scripture, all through the New Testament, we are told yeah. to receive Jesus into our heart and into our life. And she really needs to know because that's the only way that Jesus will know us is if we have a personal relationship with him while we're here. Do you, well, are you at the end? Yeah, we, okay. we, we're right. at the end. But we, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll <laughs> carry it to next week okay. or next time. Next time, In good enough. Weeks. Okay, and so we close another show. Uh, counterfeit religious groups always use God as their ultimate weapon against non-conforming members. God is always the bad guy. Negative experiences are, are always God's fault. Joseph Smith threatened his wife Emma with God's destruction if she didn't comply with polygamy. He told his plural wife, Lives. God said so. Now do it or you'll never get to heaven. Polygamy groups claim God requires all their money, property, and prosperity to be turned over to them. God needs it to build his kingdom. Therefore, if you're in poverty, that's God's fault. Tithing is God's fire insurance premiums to keep him on your side. Sexual abuse often comes from leaders who claim to be God's mouthpiece. God gets the blame for more evil than the devil does. Don't question. God will get you for that. Don't doubt. God will reveal it later. Just obey now. Children are told from the beginning, Heavenly Father is sad or disappointed in you, which begins their guilt trip for life. These are all lies about God. The Bible testifies that God is love. God is good. God wants redemption for us, not destruction. He wants a personal loving relationship with us, not a relationship mediated by threats or by bishops or by husbands or a church hierarchy. God's love is ever demonstrated on that brutal and painful sacrificial cross which opened up the door to heaven and that door still stands open and Jesus is that door. The door will close someday but you can receive God's gift of eternal life now by walking through that door but no baggage can come with you. Everything must be left behind including Joseph Smith. Just you and Jesus. Only Jesus knows the way to heaven and he'll take you there. Thanks for watching.